Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first HPA Young Entertainment Professionals webinar of 2019. The topic, Comprehensive Workflow Overview Production to Post. Um, we are recording this webinar so that folks can go back and review it at their convenience. Uh, and it will also be made available to people if they were unable to attend today. We would like to make this as interactive as possible. So if you would, uh, please ask questions, and there are two ways to do that. There should be a question or a chat box that you can use to type your questions, but we also have the ability to individually unmute you so that you can speak directly to the speaker, and that would be the preferred way to ask questions. We'll take a break at the uh, end of uh, each speaker's section for a couple of questions, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. And without further delay, I would like to turn the floor over to Mr. Jesse Carosi. Jesse, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. So I guess I'll start by first thanking Black Magic. They've been very generous in sponsoring a lot of our activities for the Young Entertainment Professionals Program. So thank you very much. And within the community, we are mentoring young professionals and we ask them what would you like to learn most and what would you like to dive into for webinars moving through 2019. A very common answer was that a lot of the young professionals had a very good understanding of what their department does but what they didn't feel they quite understood as well was how does their department affect other people and how does this all work together from end to end? So what we've decided to do is create this really giant workflow diagram that goes all the way from set through to distribution. And we're going to walk through it with different professionals speaking to each section. And the idea is that future webinars will dive deeper into these discussions. So these are going to be very quick. We're not going to spend too long on each of them, but the idea is that you'll get an idea of an intro to each of them. And in future webinars, we can have an entire webinar focused on one department or one position. So without further ado, I'll start by introducing the, from the onset side of things, we're going to introduce Ryan and he's a DIT and we'll learn a little bit about what he does and what the role of a DIT is. So over to you, Ryan. Yes, thanks. Thanks everyone for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, always love talking about DIT. Uh, so as you can see on this diagram, um, I've done a little bit of um, commercial, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit of episodic and a little bit of television and, and features, um, but really my bread and butter is commercials. Uh, I think this workflow is pretty universal regardless of the project. I think it's very well done and, and, and definitely accurate. Uh, so yeah, let me just jump right into to DIT. So DIT is a constantly changing position, and I personally think it's the greatest job in the world. I get immense satisfaction uh, with my career, and uh, just the, the DIT world is ever-changing. Every time a new camera comes out, I'm doing a lot of um, off-the-clock reading, and um, the way the technology emerges, it's just a, a really fun job. So where did DIT come from? So this is kind of my way of explaining it. I probably won't, you won't find this in any books per se, but uh, every time I've explained it in this way, it's, it's lined up pretty well with other uh, colleagues in the same position. So DIT comes, it's kind of rooted in two positions that both came from previous technologies. So the first one, uh, you know, we need to recognize that the broadcast world and live TV and news gathering and sports a lot of those technologies have really merged with cinema technologies over the year, and especially when you look at a camera like the F55 from Sony or the uh, Area Mira, we can really see, wow, that really looks like a broadcast camera uh, that we're using for cinema. So in the, in the broadcast world, we have a video controller, and that'd be somebody working in a truck or in a studio, and they'd be kind of controlling color, you know, directly integrating with the cameras. Uh, and so that's definitely been a big influence on the DIT world. Now, obviously, as a DIT, we're not live. And so we do things a little bit differently, but we need to recognize that a lot of our ways of doing things and our approach comes from that kind of video controller background. 
Uh, I kind of use the umbrella term engineering for anything kind of in that world. So that would be anything where I'm actually touching, dealing with, modifying the camera signal, not what's being recorded, but what's what's being output over a video cable or you know over wireless. Uh, so color correction, maybe I'm monitoring four cameras on a quad split, uh, you know, and sending that out to the video village. You know, it's not uncommon in the commercial world to be monitoring literally 20 cameras at once on some of the, um, you know, like a hidden camera type commercial or something like that. So yeah, engineering, color, monitoring, that whole world. So the next technology that we need to recognize that, you know, that led to the DIT position was the film lab. So obviously, you know, there's still some cellul uh, celluloid film out there, uh, things being shot on film, especially in the big budget world. But for the most pro uh, part, we're no longer doing a photochemical process with celluloid physical film and, and the halide crystals. We're now doing everything digitally. And, and so the second part of DIT position, uh, you know, two of two, would be what I just kind of call lab. So that's going to be everything that was traditionally handled by a, a film developing laboratory and now we're doing that work on set digitally so that goes into the syncing sound um, and coloring the footage for the cinematographer preparing editorial files keeping records um, of the transition from on set to hand off to post-production as far as hey here's what was shot today um, you know the dit always works directly underneath the director of photography so of, we're kind of looking in the lab realm, we're looking at kind of two things. First off, you know, hey, what is Post asking for? You know, are they cutting an Avid? They want DNX files, maybe they just want ProRes. Uh, and then we're taking all the creative decisions that the director and the director of photography made on set, and we're trying to burn those uh, creative decisions into the editorial files. So, you know, ideally at the end of the day when I'm handing off, uh, I, I'm giving files that the DP looks at and goes, yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind. Those files are, are technically accurate, they're consistent, um, and they're pretty much ready to be handed off uh, to the editor. And then also I wanna be very mindful, of course, of that I'm just technically accurate and communicating everything very clearly. So I send a lot of notes, I send stills, if I create any LUTs with the DP, um, the director of photography, I'm gonna send those files as well. I'm just really hoping that um, everyone down the chain, essentially everyone you're gonna hear from tonight, that everyone, they're, they're receiving the work um, very clearly, that they're not gonna have to call or email, hey, what did you mean here? Uh, so you know, that's where I'm gonna send stills and, and notes to just kind of really reinforce all the, the um, creative vision of the director of photography. So my last thing I'd be doing would just be putting all those files in a nicely organized hard drive and quite just like this diagram, be packaging it up and, um, you know, sending it over to an editorial house. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think one interesting point to note is, you know, we've created this giant diagram. There's a million ways to do things and quite frankly, different segments of work, whether you're talking about commercials, features, scripted episodic, multi-cam work, you know, it's all very different. And it's interesting to note that you're doing a lot of the dailies work on set because, you know, for the scripted episodic stuff, you can see specifically in this diagram that uh, we, we have a live feed going into the DIT cart, there's live grading happening, maybe you're doing iris controls, but then that would still go to a traditional lab for a bunch of scripted episodic work. So in the commercial world, you're, you're often doing that on set. Yeah, yeah, and that's a great point, yeah. So uh, a little bit more common on features and, you know, frankly, more low budget features where they, they don't have the large personnel, the big budget stuff. Uh, those are gonna be the environments where I'm making dailies on set. Uh, when I have worked on episodic, it's usually I'm just sending the, the raw camera data and then the, the audio from the audio mixer. Um, and then as well as the color decision, you know, the, the, the DPs, you know, the LUTs or the CDLs, uh, whatever you want to call them. I'm going to be sending all those off to a more yeah, traditional dailies house. And, um, you know, I'm thinking I've done some HBO shows with this type of workflow. And, you know, the, as far as the hard rendering goes, uh, the heavy lifting, that's going to be done at a separate facility. But, yeah, in, in commercial world, we're, 
typically where I'm going to be working, uh, I'm, I'm typically handling that myself. Interesting. Okay, so let's let's hold off on questions until we get Peyton to jump in. So we've also got Peyton with us, who works for a Daily's Lab, and uh, Peyton, I'll hand the floor over to you, as it'll be interesting to hear. You know, you work a little bit more on the scripted episodic side and some features. How how this works for you, and and what it, what it means to work for a lab. Sure. Thanks, Jesse, and thanks everyone for being here and having us here. Um, so yeah, um, like Ryan mentioned, there's there's a little bit of overlap depending on um, what type of you know product you're producing. Um, my position here at our company is called a workflow producer. Um, so typically, I manage a team of technical supervisors and dailies technicians um, who create and maintain digital workflows from set to post and. Um, with the advent of all this highly technolo technical camera technology and different types of software, um, Ryan did a great job of outlining the transition into this technology we have now. There's become this need to manage a large amount of data, um, and I think that's where we can kind of differentiate um, from the onset work that will happen with Ryan um, to our lab. So we'll take um, a lot of the um, information that he's creating on set, and we make sure that that information is maintained throughout the whole post-production process. So um, some of this information is, for instance, lens data, um, script supervisor notes, VFX shot names, scene take information, um, very important um, thing we generally focus on is the color pipeline. So we want to maintain what he and the DP create together on set and make sure no changes are made throughout the whole process. And so we'll definitely apply that within the lab. Um, one thing that we kind of do as well, we don't do any creative changes unless instructed to, but we do try to match shot to shot so that um, if there are any variances, like for instance, different lenses have different um, color shifts or the weather changes and there's clouds moving in the sky, um, we just make sure that all of the shots kind of match together so that there's no um, difference when they actually cut everything together and it doesn't stick out to producers who watch the offline reference. Uh, so, uh, our main goal is to make sure that um, the transition from set, all that media that's being shot, um, the sound information, the script information, um, all of that comes together and is passed along um, to editorial and VFX, conform, color, and online. Um, and we do this through the dailies process. Um, so as you see here, Jesse zoomed in. Um, the first thing we typically do is sync sound and make sure any scene and take information is filled out properly. Um, we'll also do a QC, make sure there's nothing wrong with the footage itself. Um, typically the DAT is also doing that on set. It's always helpful to have redundancy through the process. And then we apply the DIT's color correction and do the match shot to shot. And then we, on our end, are transcoding the footage um, into various formats. And this is in cases where perhaps the DIT doesn't have time on set to, um, to transcode this footage where, for instance, on the scripted episodic television series. So um, some formats we transcode to um, are usually low, lower quality editorial files that are easier to work with. What's cool about that we do is um, typically we'll set up a system in editorial suite and connect directly to their shared storage so that um, that they that we can move the media over directly to them and they can start working right away that next morning. Um, so one thing I forgot to mention is we stagger our technician shifts um, so that they come in when production is wrapping so that they can get started on processing the footage and getting it to editorial the very next day. Um, another 
thing we do is transcode screener files that can be uploaded to some kind of online screening format. And this is so that people in the network and on production can watch what they've shot the previous days. And this is kind of cool if they're shooting in another location outside of the state. Um, for instance, we work on shows all over the world. Um, they can see it in Los Angeles where the studios and the post-production facilities are. Um, and so the last thing we do during the dailies process is make sure that there's a lot of redundant backups that are created. Um, so we make sure that um, we make backups for the online facility. Um, we also make LTO backups, which are basically hard copies of the footage that will last a lot longer than a spinning disk. Um, and then we also make sure all that metadata we've tracked and maintained is uploaded into a database, and that information can be shared with other departments like VFX facilities and post-production facilities. Yeah, I think I think one one interesting thing that you noted on as well is, you know, you as that workflow producer, that workflow consultant, kind of for production and post, you're really getting in tune with both the production and the post side, and you are that gray area in between, and you're going and you're gathering all of these these notes and really making sure that okay, if someone's going to do create notes on set, making sure that they do merge into the system so that in Avid, everything's there, and in the database that gets shared out, everything's there. It's it's certainly an interesting role outside of, you know, files in, files out. You're really managing a lot of that metadata, it seems, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. I kind of say we're like the middleman between the different departments. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess what would be great is to, to take a second and see if there's any questions. Joel, are there any questions that have came in? We do have one question in the queue. Uh, before I uh, ask that, um, I'd like to remind our guests that if you'd like to ask a question, please type in to the question box. I have an oral question if you'd like to speak directly to the presenter or just type your question and I'm happy to read it on your behalf. Um, this question is uh, from uh, Sundarasan. Um, and uh, wondering, would you please talk a little bit about the loader's download station and how many copies, correct method to download data from a camera recording card? Sure, I can jump on that one. Um, so yeah, the DIT is going to be doing the actual transfer from the the media card, you know, that's coming out out of the camera. What you know, what we kind of call the digital negative or the original camera uh, file. Um, so we, first off, we want to make sure we have a, a system that, you know, in place ahead of time, not just winging it. Uh, so we, first off, we want to use some kind of data management software. So I, I love the Palmfort um, software. Uh, there's one Silverstack, and they just recently uh, released a more simple version called um, camera media manager offload manager i believe uh don't quote me on that but silverstack uh, lab is what i personally use uh, i think but, that's that's pretty standard that that and shotput pro it's one of the two that are on every job we do yeah yeah shotput pro would be the other one uh but the important thing is first you know i i like to have a digital receipt uh a file um that's saying yes this has been done and and here's kind of you know, a, a paper trail, if you will, of what data, uh, because sometimes roles get uh, mislabeled and, and it's good to have kind of a, a little paper. And then, of course, um, there's the infamous hashtag, um, or I'm sorry, uh, XX hash or MD5, uh, a checksum rather. <laughs> and um, that's going to be kind of a digital uh, clarification process, a digital security process, um, you know, kind of guaranteeing that what was on the the card the the camera card is exactly what's on your hard drive and then just as far as hard drives this diagram is very accurate so uh typically we like to have um you know i have my own um you know one or two uh you know very fast ssd based raids for you know high performance and large capacity and then i'm uh usually also putting that onto two uh separate drives um one that's kind of referred to as the production backup 
and then one that's going to be more the the shuttle drive uh, as as seen in this diagram here that's going to be going to the dailies facility so a minimum of three copies um, and then yeah, uh, I think that's pretty safe and and this this does change slightly job to job but there's a lot of factors here you know if you have a dailies lab on point they're doing the archival what might happen is you might actually only have two um, or sometimes you might have three, but at minimum, you need to make sure at least one of these is checksummed. And then every time a, a copy is made down the line in post, you want to be re-verifying that checksum to know nothing has been damaged. But, you know, it, sometimes we have jobs where we'll shoot in a certain country and the, you know, the, the, the DIT position some of the responsibilities might change, but there's always going to be someone, at least on the jobs that we do at SIM, there's always someone downloading media. You know, different different jurisdictions may call it something different, but um, it's important that, that the data integrity is, is of utmost importance. And Jesse, we do have two additional questions, a follow-up from uh, Sundarison. Uh, so uh, MD5 checksum is considered mandatory? Depends who you're working for. If you're working on a Netflix job, yes. If you're working for certain other studios, not necessarily. XX hash may be fine. The thing is that MD5 can also be put in different format containers. You know, an MHL is one that I personally like. Um, but yeah, I mean, MD5 is kind of the gold standard, but there's certainly a lot of people doing XX hash. Ryan, would you have an opinion on that? I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, one thing I've said out loud a, a handful of times throughout my career is, you know, there's the literal definition of what a DIT does, and then there's some kind of more covert. And one of the more covert, you know, it, it's a very large responsibility when you're having handling camera data. And so for me, I've kind of said DIT is the art of liability removal. And so, um, you know, I can check out the camera and I can you know, check out the media and I can do tests in the camera prep and I can make sure everything's performing it to my specifications. But at the end of the day, it's a computer chip and I can't actually look at the actual ones and zeros, um, you know, that that's being written to that. And I'm, I'm putting a lot of trust into my computer and the hard drives and, you know, they don't know if they're not working correctly. And Hopefully I, I'm properly equipped and I, you know, I'm very thorough in my quality control. And luckily I, I know typically I'll have some things down the, uh, down the chain. People are watching my back, like the dailies lab or the editorial at times in case something does slip through the cracks. But really my job is to put as much effort as, in, as possible to, to really get an objective feedback that is very verifiable and, um, you know, I don't I don't want to go to the director of photography at the end of the day and say, hey, I'm pretty sure we got all the data. You know, uh, it, it's something I want to be extremely certain about. So I'm going to do an XX hash um, if occasionally I am on jobs where it's, you know, for, for whatever reason, the workflow demands or, um, you know, because we're going through an LTO process, um, you know, and, and sometimes MD5 XX hash. Uh, is typically much faster, but I I don't um, complain when I need to do MD5s because it's it's worth my time. But I'm also going to be visually inspecting the footage, and it's kind of it's not there until it's there. And uh, you know, on some uh, I might even take it a step further on some of the the camera systems that use a virtual fire fire system. I might uh, actually do more of like an R-sync, like more of a code-based um, transfer alongside the checksum. So I'm kind of skipping the uh, the operating system GUI and, and, you know, getting pretty nerdy with it. Um, you know, I just, it's, of utmost, there's nothing, at the end of the day, you know, the LUTs can be redone. I can even visit those the next day. The transcodes can be redone. But once that card's been formatted, you know, it, it's gone. <laughs> so, there's nothing yeah, more important. Very, very important point. And I feel like that sometimes when people are shooting airy raw open gate or something, you're you're gonna that's when you're gonna have be whoever's downloading your cards start to question whether MD5 is necessary because when you're dealing with a lot of data, it can make a big difference. We've been, certainly been on jobs where we've gotten like 13 terabytes a day. And the yeah. question of do you MD5 or do you XX hash makes a major difference. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, and so, so were there any other ones as well? You said there was a couple questions? Yes, actually. Um, our guest, uh, Pei Lun, asks, uh, what kind of metadata do you capture on set? Sure, I can um, I can answer that. Um, there's all sorts of good stuff. Um, for instance, lens metadata um, is really important for the VFX houses. Um, it, you can track the zooms, what type of lenses are used, um, as long as they're smart lenses. Um, smart lenses have a little attachment that can be tracked in cameras, and that information can be passed along and then passed along to the VFX facilities so that they know how to position their virtual cameras. Um, another thing we track um, is script supervisor notes. Um, it, you can have different software that's digital that will record the script supervisor notes, um, any notes from the directors, the circled takes, anything about, you know, maybe the actors of the scene, that type of stuff. That, as long as it's the corresponding software, can be exported and imported into your AVID project so that the assistant editors don't have to go through and manually log everything. Um, so those are just a couple things. Yeah, I think like VFX data wrangler notes are starting to get imported as well. I've actually seen a couple jobs that had digital camera reports as well. That's not quite as common, but a lot of these notes are starting to become digital and it's it's becoming more and more common to transfer that into the Avid so that it's available. You know, we had a job recently where we were providing all this data on, on a, a TV show called Happy and it's great because if someone was like, I know there was another take where, you know, John got shot in the living room and you search John, you search gunshot and boom, all the takes come up in Avid that, that had that metadata tagged to it, which is, which is pretty cool because it helps the creative. It's not just a technical thing. And Jesse, we have one more question for uh, this break and it's from Sundarasan. Um, what are the steps to take before formatting the recording card? Um, yeah, uh, Ryan DIT again. Um, so one piece of software I, um, and of course it's totally blanking on me now. Um, well, let me just kind of take a step back. Um, you know, this is kind of a, as much of a digital process as it is a physical, but, um, you know, of course, when it comes out of the camera, we like to put, you know, a physical piece of tape on it, uh, you know, camera tape, um, uh, paper tape of some sort um, and then it's going to go to my cart and hopefully be downloaded as soon as possible. Uh, it's definitely going to go through a verification uh, of the software like the checksum as we we're talking about. I'm then going to go on on you know if I'm working on a Mac just on a finder level and just make sure that you know hey if the card says 100 gigs and I'm going to check on the hard drives hey is there also 100 gigs there. Uh, the last step I'm going to be doing is kind of visually scrubbing through it, making sure that the camera's functioning possibly. And, and um, you know, if there's any uncertainties, I'm going to just go to the script supervisor and just say, hey, you know, I, I had, you know, 12 takes on that last card. Is that what you had? Okay, great. And I could also compare notes with the second AC who's who's going to be tracking that through the, the camera reports. Um, and then uh, I'm using a software, which I really apologize, it's completely blanking on me right now, but it's, uh, I know it's called the Safe-ish card formatter, but essentially uh, most of the time the camera assistants prefer that I'm doing the formatting um, and I'm gonna format it into a way that kind of confuses the camera in a sense where uh, it's gonna be very obvious that, that it's been through my station and I'm kind of putting a little digital signature on it probably a good way of saying it um, to show that the camera team of hey yes this has gone through the DIT cart it didn't just get put on my cart and then immediately returned back into circulation they want kind of a digital sign off from me because that so, actually prompts you on the camera right and yeah then, and then if, yeah and if they don't see the prompt they know wait a second Ryan never got this yeah um, I can probably just in a minute or two tell you the name of the software um, um, that I'm thinking of but um, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I think also with, um, with, with some of the work that we do for the large features, 
what will happen is the cards will go through the onset person they'll be sent to us and after they go through the process of having ltos created there's certainly some jobs we do where they will not wipe cards on set until the ltos are done there's other jobs where as long as there are three copies and there are checksums they're okay with it it depends on on the job who the studio is and really the level of the job but there's certainly a, an, a certain amount of redundancy that is consistent between any job that you need to have a certain amount of copies completed before you're allowed to do so. I personally like when LTOs are done because that's the actual negative that's going into archival. Yes. But then that means that you, you need to know that this process between going from set all the way into the dailies lab and having this archive complete is going to be fast enough that you can wipe these cards to get reused without running out of cards. Yeah. Yeah, I would just say on a on a commercial it's more common to have say four cards per camera because we're expected to be formatting them throughout the day where on a TV show episodic it's much more common to have, you know, in the realm of 40 to 50 because we are waiting from that uh, all clear uh, usually coming in about 24 hours later from post. Yeah, I would I would usually recommend people have enough cards to get through two days. They shoot one day, they have enough to get through the next day, but really we're probably going to be telling them by like 11 a.m. that they're good to wipe the cards, but just in case. Yeah. All right, we should we should move on though. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So let me zoom out here. After Peyton and her team or even Ryan on certain jobs, gets through their work, like Peyton was talking about, Avid Media is going to be sent directly to editorial. So at that point, while we are in the editorial side of things, I'm gonna introduce, let me just jump to the next. Tyler Cook, so Tyler is an editor that's joining us and he's going to speak to the editorial side of things. Hi, how's it going? Um, so yeah, so basically, as Peyton was mentioning, the drive will come to us either either it'll be uploaded, like she said, where it'll just appear on our SAN, or we'll really uh, receive drives every day. It's sort of depending on the security of the network and the show that you're working on and how they like to do things. But um, but yeah, so it's you know a, a typical episode. You know, it's a, basically you have an assistant editor and an editor, and the assistant's responsible for bringing in and and kind of wrangling all of the dailies for the day and assembling it and and into scene bins and kind of providing it into the smaller chunks that I will deal with. Um, and as as this is as the business has gone more digital and we're just shooting a lot more film, so. The work that Peyton and Ryan do is just so, so important for us because um, our schedules have only gotten shorter as well. So it's like we're we're getting a lot more footage and have a lot less time to put them together. So when everything is working smoothly and well, it's just a dream because, you know, we have to process uh, the dailies and bring them in, get them broken into their individual uh, scenes, and then I have to cut them. And generally speaking, we shoot about seven days per episode in episodic, um, seven or eight, depending uh, if it's half hour or hour. And then I have two to three days to turn around an editor's cut. So um, we really need that stuff to come in as perfect as, as close to perfect as can be, because if there are any issues with either takes missing or missing audio or anything like that, it's it really slows us down and kind of can get in the way. But, um, you know, I think with the redundancy that's in place now, it's very rare that you run into that issue anymore. Um, but yeah, so my assistant editor is bringing in all the dailies and and passing them off to me. And at that point, I'm assembling them. And my job, I kind of see it as a sort of, you know, you're kind of taking the script and you're taking what was shot and you're trying to find the perfect uh, way to represent both of those things because it's not going to be perfect to the word and you know a lot of times on set they're not able to get everything that they want to get so you are trying to build the show and make it as presentable as possible in about like I said nine to ten days to um, to you know to make it available for everybody to start weighing in and giving their notes um, the way scripted television works we send out an editor's cut and when we do that we want it to be as close to 
I say arable as possible, meaning we don't just submit like an assembly or work in progress. It, it needs to sound and look as best as possible. So we're adding temp music, we're adting temp sound effects. If it's a VFX show or if there's any sort of little VFX involved, we are doing a close approximation uh, to tell the story. I mean, we're not going to do uh, a very good job on the VFX end, um, but we're going to at least try to sell the creative uh, idea or uh, intent of that shot so people know what they're looking at. Um, and so we're doing a lot of work um, in that nine to 10 days to get the show up on its feet and, and feeling like a TV show. Um, at that point, we hand it off to the director and the director spends about three days uh, giving any notes they have, um, which is really mostly about kind of their intent like uh you know i wanted to start the shot on you know scene on this shot or you know this is what i meant for this moment um because a lot of times the director is moving so fast on set they don't have really time to communicate with post in terms of how how they want a scene to play out um, so they spend three days and then it goes to the producers um and the producers are going to take about a week or two with it um, we'll go through many different cuts with them to try to, you know, work out any problem areas um, or, you know, just kind of maybe have to cut cut it down for time. A lot of times you're over about five or six minutes um, and are having to get it down to a certain target, um, TRT. Um, and from the producers, it'll go through to, you know, your, your uh, studios or your networks. Um, so whether it's Netflix or Paramount or, or Warner Brothers or whoever, um, and then we kind of go through, depending on the network, one or two rounds of notes at that point. Um, and, and then, you know, and then we lock. We lock a uh, picture at least. Um, and, you know, that is when my assistant comes back in the picture in a really big way um, because she is going to take the final picture and start to disseminate all of that information to the various departments. Uh, back to um, the Daily's house to start conform, uh, sound, visual effects, uh, basically doing all the turno turnovers that you're going to hear a lot more about in a second. But, you know, she is trying to make sure that everything that comes from she or he is trying to make sure that everything that comes from post-production in our room is as true to what the show creators, showrunners, editors, whoever intended. So they just want to make sure that all that information and all that metadata that was collected at the beginning makes its way through to the next stage. Very cool. All right, well, before I get into what we will do with some of those elements, does anybody have any questions? Brian asks, what I am often confused by is how you deal with nu numerous audio sources from the set. Uh, if you, uh, like if you have eight, I know there's a mix, but what if some sounds come from some places and others come from other places? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm working on Glow right now, and we have anywhere from two to 14 characters in, in any given scene. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, what we get, um, what I start to cut with are... Uh, um, is you know the dailies that just has a single mix track because otherwise it would be i think too overbearing on a kind of timeline sort of uh you know track management to kind of wrangle all of those microphones so i deal with the 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 mix and then uh, what often ends up happening is i have to go in and find the um the the labs the boot they you know if there's more than one boom whatever all of that information is really is right at my fingertips and that's a big thanks to uh Peyton and the people in dailies because they are prepping that so it easily matches back so if i just have to hit a match back button and i'll go from the mix track to all 14 tracks of audio and then i can use the metadata uh it'll tell me track one is this track two three four etc and so i can easily narrow down a pinpoint like oh i need that person's lab that's it's on track eight let me cut that in um and so it really gives me a lot more um sort of leeway and also a lot more control to kind of really dial in the sound so that people aren't struggling to hear um what's being said especially in crowded scenes when there's a lot of people talking 
yeah, obviously, as we can see here in the image that you <laughs> that you provided, there's you're not just using a mix down. There's lots going on in here. <laughs> Yeah, and we're stealing from a lot of different sources, you know, we're using our own temp sound effects in there and music as well, but like we, you know, my dialogue tracks can be anywhere from, you know, two to six, you know, tracks of just dialogue um, and, you know, more as needed. But I try to use as few as possible just, just for wrangling purposes, but, you know, some things call for more than others. Yeah, and in that in that situation, like he was alluding to with Peyton, it's important that that you know if it was if it was an avid job you'd be delivering as an example master clips with all tracks of sound online and then you deliver a sub clip which match frames to it with just the mix down so that makes it easy yeah the last part of his uh, question was does it get crazy um but then he follows up uh, so you start on the mix uh but can match back to pick out one of the isos if you need it Correct. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times the sound mixers on set are doing their job very well and there's not a huge need to go back to it. But when there's when there's many, many characters, you do have to do it. OK. Uh, Timothy asks, how do you maintain curatorship of the DP's artistic choices on through to deliverables? That's a good question. I mean, you know, it's interesting. We, it's something that we really take into cons into consideration when we're cutting the film. But I, you know, it's it's one of those things that's a little tricky because we are there to service the story, and a lot of times you're dealing with showrunners and creators and directors who who want to you know, tell the story the best way possible. And oftentimes that means like, hey, we need it, or or you'll get a note like, hey, we need this to be a close-up. Can you make this a close-up? And it's like, well, I can zoom in on it. Yeah, I can, you know, I can punch in, I can resize, um, you know, certain things like that. So you, what you're trying to do is, is maintain what was shot on set to as close as possible. But you also realize there's a whole host of tools that you can use to enhance or, or, or change or modify. Um, to to kind of get the creative intent that the showrunner is looking for. So you're trying to strike that balance, which is always tricky. Okay, great. And the final question so far is from David. David asks, are you always sending all of the production audio sources to mix so that they have options or just the ones you're using? I usually receive the ones that are being used at a given time, but it, it depends. Uh, it depends on how the production sound mixer likes to work. Um, sometimes I'll get everything, and sometimes I'll just get the people that are in the scene. Um, so, it, which you know, it's, I prefer, so I don't have to hunt through you know redundant takes uh, or redundant tracks. But um, but yeah, it can be either way. That was the final question. All right. Well, let's continue on with the VFX side of things. And uh, we can see here we've got a VFX editor in this situation assigning new VFX names to any of the shots that are approved to go through that chain. So before I hand it off to Ashley, what I'll just mention is that it's pretty common that an EDL would be created. That's sent to the dailies lab or the online facility. Ideally, whoever holds the entire negative, that's put into a software like Transcoder or Hero or DaVinci Resolve, or there's many applications that can do it. And you would convert that out to ZPX or EXR, and those would then be sent to the VFX facility. So why don't I start by introducing our next speaker, who is Ashley Ward, who's a VFX production manager, and I'll let her speak to the specific VFX side of things. Hey, everybody. I'm Ashley. Um, I'm a production manager. Right now, I'm working in TV. I have been for several years. Uh, but this, uh, this job isn't usually one that most TV shows have. Most TV shows are taken care of by a coordinator and a producer. Um, whenever shows get a little bit larger is whenever they need um, someone to kind of manage um, just the throughput of everything. Um, so to talk workflow, uh, we get the edit from 
are from the editors. Um, and we go through and dissect everything into individual shots. We're looking for anything that needs to be fixed. Um, sometimes we know about this ahead of time. Sometimes a, um, whenever it's big visual effects, it's been planned in advance and we've been talking about it since before the shoot. But there are also other um, fixes that happen, so you have to keep your eagle eyes on whenever you're looking through all of the material to make sure that you're catching the water bottle that someone left in frame <laughs> and all of that kind of stuff. Um, once we do that, we kind of uh, split up the shots based on the work, the type of work that they do. Um, the teams that I've worked on like to split it up by uh, which vendor has a specialty. So we're giving who's best equipped to do the work, the work that they can do best. Um, whenever we're going through the edit, we're not just pulling the plates, we're also pulling um, different kinds of reference material. So um, I don't know if anybody has ever seen it, but a lot of times they will shoot a, a lens grid um, as a separate element. Uh, during a day, they have a huge grid that's usually um, seven foot, well, ours was seven foot by four foot, and then you just shoot um, a couple of frames of that, and we use that to undistort the lens so that as our companies are working on the footage, they can work in a flat space. Um, we also do uh, Macbeth charts, which are the charts that have all the color, uh, little color things on them, and that's so that we can um, take the footage and make sure that we're working in the truest color space. The other thing that we usually take are uh, balls, and you'll see these things that look like barbells, and one side of them are flat gray, and the other side are mirrored, or there could be two separate ones. Um, these are taken for lighting reference. The flat gray one will give you an overall idea of how, um, how the lighting is set up on the day, and the mirror ball will give you an idea of the reflections. Um, so we take all of that material and we put it in EDL and we send it off to our friends at SIM who uh, transcode it and send, our, uh, send us and our vendors the DPXs that we requested. Um, once the vendors download it, um, we're also supplying them from our side lineups and um, cut references for them to work to. Um, they'll bring in the plates. And if they have CG work, they'll use those lens grids to undistort the camera so that they can do work. Um, depending on what kind of work it is will depend on what kind of software is used. Um, the main compositing packages that are used are, uh, are Nuke and uh, After Effects, but there are a, a lot of things that you can use. Um, there are a lot of tracking specialty softwares. There are a lot of 3D specialty softwares. Um, there are a lot of effects, specialty softwares, and, and uh, vendors also like to write their own versions of software. So um, there's a lot that can be <laughs> there's a lot that can be done to our frames. Um, they send us versions back, and we give them feedback until uh, we all agree that it looks great. And once it's great, uh, we'll send the they'll send us the final DPX. Our team QCs it, and then we send it off to color. Yeah, all right. So then here's the DPX sent to the DI facility. So one thing that's important to note here is this look is carried on from Ryan on set through to Peyton, now through to the VFX facility. So it's very important that once that VFX facility gets this look, because they're going to be rendering shots to go back to Ashley's team, we need to know that that's going to match the dailies so that when that goes back, it's cut into the offline and everything lines up. And then also, when they render this log C in this scenario, because we're using an Alexa, they render that DPX frame, we need to know that that matches the negative. So when you drop that into the final online, it matches the actual camera files. So, does anybody have any questions about the VFX side of things? There are no questions at this time. All right. Well, next up then, we're going to be switching gears to go into sound. So, we've got two people that are going to speak to sound. I'm going to introduce 
both names uh, before jumping into this so they can tag team this effort. We've got James Parnell, who's a re-recording mixer and sound supervising editor. And we've also got Jacob Ortiz, who's an ADR supervisor. So over to you guys. Thanks very much, Jesse. Uh, yeah, as Jesse said, my name is James Parnell. Um, I'm a supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer at Monkeyland Audio. Um, I think um, it's probably important to start off on the turnover phase, um, getting material from um, the editorial staff. Um, as a supervising sound editor, um, we'll be getting turnover from, um, I think, the AEs um, who provide us who provide us with the um, the you know picture turnover uh, DNX 36 is on the screen right there which is a preferred codec uh, EDLs um, the AF file which contains basically the editor's roadmap of sound that we're going to be working with as well as um, it says master sound files there I'm assuming what that means is like audio guide tracks like dialogue music and effects which are just yeah, basically like wave files is what I had in mind like the yeah, yeah, yeah. recorded from set yeah, perfect. Oh, okay. So like dailies turn audio dailies turnover. Um, so yeah. basically, when that arrives, um, it's a good moment for me as a supervising sound editor to introduce the uh, assistant sound editors on my team to the AEs. Um, it's important that they have contact throughout the turnover process. Um, and then immediately when we get all of that, we will um, <clears throat> run what's called a sound spotting session, which is when the creatives. Uh, will come to the uh, sound studio and they'll meet me as well as um, possibly Jacob if he's around and we'll sit um, and watch down the entire episode or entire feature film and we'll uh, be running that out of a Pro Tools session and we'll be making uh, notes the entire time. Um, notes can range from, you know, like uh, what the director uh, or, or creatives on the on the show want to achieve sonically overall for the whole the whole show. Um, or they'll probably uh, also want to flag specific scenes that need special attention um, or, you know, or big sound design moments um, that, you know, that they, they have uh, very specific uh, desires for. Um, so then from that point, um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll end up going away and I'll basically take the spotting session um, and distribute it. It's just a, a Pro Tool session, basically, and I can distribute it um, to the dialogue editor, um, sound effects editor, background editor, um, the Foley team, and um, they can, you know, import the markers into their session, which are basically um, blank sessions where they'll import the, uh, the AF file that we received from the assistant sound editor as kind of like an initial starting point. Uh, it's actually the AF file at the beginning of the, the, the timeline, but, oh, actually that, that works as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just watching you, Jesse. Uh, no and then um, simultaneously, while all of that is going on, um, you know, the composer who will have been brought on earlier in the process, slightly earlier in the process, will be, um, you know, mocking up their, um, you know, their musical ideas, um, digitally, and then if it if it necessitates uh, orchestral recordings or stuff like that, they'll be going to sound scoring stages. Um, uh, simultaneous to all of this, um, I'll be going through the dialogue assembly process with my assistant sound editorial team. Um, I see you've got a program called Titan there, which is um, great uh, for assembly dialogue. There's another one that we use, um, which has the added benefit of not having to demultiplex um, polyphonic wave files, which is called EddyLoad. Uh, it's made by a, a fantastic company called Sounds and Sync, um, but uh, yeah, either one of those programs works perfectly well to assemble the dialogue. Um, I should mention at this point, really quickly, that um, the initial turnover process from the AEs, it's, it, um, it was encouraging to hear uh, Tyler um, say that, you know, um, providing us with an EDL with all of the necessary metadata, um, sound roll information, uh, you know, scene and take information, uh, you know, in the actual name of the of the uh, the wave file is extremely important, um, and that helps us use Titan or Eddy Load to assemble the dialogue, um, all of the channels that are recorded on set. So we receive not just the you know boom one and two, but we receive all of the characters' lobs that are being recorded um, as the as the scene is being shot. Um, and then at this point, um, uh, I'll hand it over to Jacob, who's going to talk about how he um, either goes through a, a dialogue assembly or he goes through a dialogue edit and cues. Um, ADR, which is basically the re-recording of dialogue that's unusable. Um, so I'll hand it over to Jacob. 
Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Uh, so yeah, so as James uh, mentioned, um, I think Tyler actually mentioned uh, things are kind of moving fast nowadays as far as uh, turnover, things having to get finished and meeting deadlines. So I don't always have the luxury of using um, the finished dialogue edited from the from the editor, which which is nice. Most times um, I'm using the DX load to kind of listen down um, critically. So basically I'll listen down, watch the whole film down, listen, do some critical listening and listen out for anything that could be potential issues down the line as far as background noise, uh, mic noise, any technical issues with the mics. Uh, and any, anything that's just not salvageable, you know, I, I, I try to, I'll try to make an honest effort to try to clean up dialogue the best I can. You know, if I'm spending more than like three or five minutes on it, then I think it's best to just try to try to get it in ADR. Um, so, you know, at that point, uh, I'll make all my notes that I think we should probably, my recommendations that we should probably do for ADR. And, and I'll also, at that point, incorporate anything I'm getting from the dialogue editor, the director, anything from the cutting room, any notes from network and producers, um, if they feel like they need to add anything to add to the story or take things out or change change lines uh, to help, help the story along uh, for the audience. Um, and I'll also pull in the notes from the spotting session, and if there's anything I need to add, I'll incorporate that also. And once uh, that's all said and done, I'll generate uh, cue sheets, which I'll then send out to the post supervisor, who then will send those out to actors who request them or their agents request them for the actors to see to get prepped before they come into the session. And uh, he'll also pass those along to the director. And usually once that we get to that point, the post supervisors or his assistants or, or somebody will start reaching out to agents and trying to wrangle in all these actors because at this point they're probably working on other projects and they could literally be anywhere in the world. And uh, we have to try and track them down and, and sort the time with them and match the time in the studio and try to coordinate all that, which sometimes gets a little hectic. <laughs> Ideally, for the most part, uh, I think they try to knock it out. I mean, we could it could go like probably a month or two into a couple weeks or a week of ADR. It really depends. I think most uh, post supervisors try to get everybody at once as quickly as possible um, before they become unavailable. And how often would you say this is happening? Like how much how much of a I guess this changes job to job as to just how much re-recording you'd actually have to do? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's constantly changing. I mean, it, there's always there's always ADR, pretty much. But, I mean, it really depends on what we're getting and what we're hearing. And, you know, I mean, there's been times where um, directors have specifically really not want to do ADR or, or, or they, they have notes of themselves wanting to replace entire scenes at times, which happens often. Interesting. So once we... Once we once we got the talent, everything's coordinated. We, we'll bring in the talent here, and um, we'll start the recording process. Um, you know, I try to look back way at the beginning of the process from the uh, production sound mixer. I look at his sound report. I try to get matching microphones and do the best I can to try to replicate what they did on that day, as far as mic placement and all that stuff goes. Um, if there's any actors anywhere across the world, say like in London, we have we use software like Source Connect, ISDN, Skype, where a director could be sitting here in LA and we'll be listening to an actor in London. And we can watch what they're watching, and we're on the same page in sync and um, getting all that ADR and stuff. And that's pretty much it for the recording, you know, which, you know, it could be difficult at times trying to replicate performance and the pitch and the timing, but we do, we do the best we can. And once that's all said and done, we've got the recording. We did some, oh, we also do loop group which is, you know, if there's scenes with big um, crowds or stuff like that, we'll have a group of people come in and we'll try to just um, create that environment with the, with the people. And once all that's said and done, I'll go into the edits, uh, edit phase. And I'll try to clean up the dialogue the best I can, any pops and clicks, get the fades in there, get it real nice and clean. Um, I'll try to improve sync. Uh, using some time compression uh, software and stuff like that to get it as tight as possible. And once that's all set, I'll get it all prepped and send it all to, over to the mix, the mix stage where uh, James will pick up from there.
Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, so um, as Jacob was saying, he's, as he's doing all of that, um, our editorial staff, um, just to backtrack very quickly, uh, all of our editorial staff, the dialogue uh, editor, sound effects editor, backgrounds editor, and Foley team will be doing their magic. Um, dialogue editor will be um, parsing through the what's called the dialogue assembly, which is obviously, as I mentioned, the um, complete collection of microphones. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll kind of pick the best path through uh, edits, making sure that going from boom to lav microphone is as seamless as possible. Um, backgrounds are in charge of, of ambiences and scenes. You know, um, this can be as, you know, as, as obvious as if you're in a, you know, if you're in a, a, a schoolyard, you know, you're cutting the sound of, of kids playing, but if it's a period drama, it becomes much more complicated. Um, sound effects editorial typically handles things like, um, we call them hard effects, uh, doors, closes, gunshots, punches. Um, there's another aspect, which I don't know if it's listed there, sound design, which is um, the creation of things that aren't, don't necessarily have an earthly basis, like, um, you know, what does, what does a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex sound like? Uh, what does a, you know, a, a 60 foot metal robot sound like? That's all um, part of the sound design process. Um, the sound, supervising sound editor can take on that role. Um, uh, it's, it's not uncommon for a supervising sound editor to, to be the sound designer of a show, but he can also, like, for example, I'm, I'm working on a film right now, I'm the dialogue editor as well as the supervising sound editor of the show, so um, it's kind of doubling up on the work, but it's taking some of the, the weight off of the sound effects editorial team. So then, um, rocketing forward, um, once all of Jacob's ADR is cut and once all of the editors have done their work, um, the supervising sound editor is responsible for comping all of these editorial sessions, which are all done in Pro Tools, into a master Pro Tools session for mix. So what they'll do is communicate with the re-recording mixer. Um, in this situation, it would be me communicating with myself. Um, so I have um, uh, several different mix templates. Um, I have stuff for television, um, which uh, you know is, is better suited for for uh, you know sh shows that are uh, t 20 or 40 minutes long. Um, and I have stuff that you know more robust templates um, for film mixes. Um, so I'll comp all the dialogue into the same session as the um, sound effects backgrounds. Um, the Foley editor would have, uh, after the recording process for Foley footsteps and, and props would have been done. They would have edited that. Uh, they would have delivered it to me. Uh, I would have comped that all together. Um, uh, again, I would have taken Jacob's ADR and then we would have gotten a delivery from a composer. Um, usually it's his, his music editor who does the delivery. So again, my assistant sound editors would reach out to the music editor, um, establish contact. Um, we'd comp everything together. We'd send them like a spec sheet as, as to how we want to receive our, you know, their Pro Tools turnover. But, and, you know, regardless of that, we'd, we'd figure out a way to comp it into our mix sessions. And then we'd hit the mix stage um, for the final mix. So, um, you know, that would be, if it was a feature film, they like to break, you know, traditionally it was broken up into reels um, of film and it's still done today. Um, you know, it tip, it's not uncommon for us to receive films that have five or six reels of, of uh, well, you know, quote unquote footage. Um, uh, you know, and 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 uh, we'd aim to get a reel of footage done a day. So, um, so basically, that a, a typical reel is about 20 minutes. Um, you know, so 20 times five, 100 minutes, or 20 times six. Um, and uh, yeah, and and then uh, you know, we'll we'll aim to kind of typically. I mean, bigger budget projects have um, uh, time built in for what's called pre-dubs or pre-mixing, which is when I have the stage to myself and I can take all of the kind of non-creative technical stuff out of the way before the clients walk on. So I'd have for a five reel film, I'd have, you know, two or three days of, of pre-dubbing or pre-mixing where I could get all the dialogue um, in the pocket, EQ'd, compressed, sounding good and working with the backgrounds. And then when the clients walk onto the stage, the dialogue is already sounding great, which is, is half the battle of, of any sound mix. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, I'd just be adding in music and sound effects and, and sound design and, and everything would sound, you know, 50% there, um, which makes their job uh, more fun, more creative, um, and less of a hassle for the re-recording mixer and supervising sound editor. Um, in a traditional mix scenario, th those two roles are different. Um, so you would have a supervising sound editor sitting with a re-recording mixer on the mix stage. And if the clients had a request to change out a sound effect, like for example, if a car buy or a car skid uh, around a corner wasn't working, the clients would uh, you know, relay that message to the uh, mixer. The supervising sound editor would jump in, mitigate that situation by um, saying that he could take care of it. He would recut that sound effect and push it to my mix rig, which would be um, just a computer that I'm, I'm I'm using, and then I can just import that the you know those two or three tracks or or four or five tracks depending on how how robust this, the redesign was, and I would just mix it in, and that that makes for seamless mixing um, throughout the process. 
and then um, just being conscious of time, I'll move on. So, so at, at the end of the day, uh, we um, will do a playback and notes, um, and um, oftentimes Tyler, like someone like the editor, would be uh, on the mix stage with us, and he would help us find, um, you know, where some of the the tricky edits that he had he had a tough time, uh, you know, with uh, were you know were buried, and and if we miss them in the, in, the, in the sound process, we can kind of use sound design to smooth over those edits. Um, but the notes will be largely anything from um, creative stuff like, you know, can you reduce the sound of the ringing in this character's ears to, um, you know, can we make this explosion bigger to uh, more technical notes, uh, which would be like, um, you know, there's, there's a hiss on this line of dialogue that I missed or, uh, you know, like this line is slightly out of sync. Um, hopefully that stuff is taken care of, but sometimes it, it's missed and we just need to knock it a frame or two in sync. And then at the very, very, very end of the process, we go through a, a process called print mastering, which is uh, where we um, quote unquote lay back the entire mix. Um, the term lay back comes from the days of tape where we would lay the mix back to tape, but now it's just printing digitally. So we'd often ha at times have a separate computer which would be recording um, what we call stem files. So dialogue, music, sound effects, backgrounds, and fully. Um, uh, I would put the group uh, in with dialogue, but but um, because it's more of a dialogue uh, thing, but, um, and then from those stems, the stems would feed in to make what's called a print master. Uh, and then the print master gets folded down into the LTRT print master. Um, uh, the LTRT print master is a left total, right total mix of the 5.1. So the, the, the third down from the top, the print master is the 5.1 mix. The LTRT is the stereo sum, which is what you would hear if you were listening to Netflix uh, on your laptop, which uh, ironically is what most people uh, listen to uh, as opposed to the 5.1. But if you have a good home theater system, you're listening to the actual print master that was recorded on stage. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then, yeah, the final stems are sent to a DI facility. Um, so it, they marry the audio to picture at the end of the VFX process. Uh, and it's sent off to QC for um, quality control. And I think that's it. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry, Does anybody have, yeah, this is very interesting. Does anyone have any questions, Joel? Well, we did have two questions. Uh, they were answered. However, one just popped in. Um, Iris asks, hi, thanks for the sharing. It's really helpful. I'm wondering what would the standard uh, delivery format in uh, TV episodes, or what is it? Um, would it be 7.1 like in film? Right, so uh, this is uh, it's a good question. Um, typically, uh, network television would have been 5.1 with a stereo down mix, and then you would supply 5.1 stems and their stereo summed uh, counterparts. So you would have 5.1 dialogue and a stereo uh, a down mix of dialogue, 5.1 music and a stereo down mix of music, 5.1 sound effects and a down mix of sound effects. And then obviously the print master would be 5.1, some down stereo. But um, more and more we're seeing, specifically with Netflix actually, we're seeing Netflix um, uh, desiring um, natively mixed Atmos shows, which um, if you know anything about Dolby Atmos, it's the uh, new basically standard in, in audio mixing. It's um, uh, basically a, a 7.1.2, 7 so it's a, a 7.1 um, bed of sound, so left, center, right, left side surround, right side surround, left rear surround, right rear surround sub uh, with basically two or four, depending on the size of the Atmos mix, uh, overhead quadrants uh, for, for sound mixing. Um, so we would mix natively in that format, and then we would do what's called re-renders down to different formats, uh, various different formats, um, to provide the network with all the deliverables that they want. So they would, from, a, from an Atmos mix, you can basically click a button and get your 7.1, your 5.1, your stereo, and uh, equally with all your stems, you can have, you know, an Atmos um, stem deliverable session. So, and, and we do have one additional question from Iris, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time because audio is not my expertise. Um, when you talk about stereo, is it LTRT or LORO? That's actually, that's a really good question as well. So um, LTRT and LORO are completely different. LTRT is a method of folding down a 5.1 in the stereo where the left surround and right surround, the phase is flipped by 90 degrees. So it's, it's um, the, the phase information is flipped so you don't get any phasing when you, when you put the left surround channel into the left speaker and the right surround channel into the right speaker. Um, basically what happens is in a 5-1 mix, the center, the mono channel where dialogue would live is dropped about 3 dB and put into both the left and right speaker. 
um, and the surrounds are flipped 90 degrees, put into the left and right speaker, and the sub is mixed in typically at minus 6 dB of what it truly is into both the left and right speakers. LORO is a method of um, literally just summing the left information and the right information into the left and right speakers. So um, you, uh, they, they dip the uh, level on the surrounds and put it into the left and right speakers. Um, and, you know, there's, there's some, um, uh, uh, how should I say, panning articulation that's lost in that process. Um, but it's, it's, it's equally valid to make a, a stereo image, but um, typically networks provide LTRT for the sole reason that you can upmix an LTRT into 5.1. Um, it's, uh, you use a Dolby decoder box, which if you have a hi-fi system at home, you'll notice like PL1 and PL2 is, is, a, is an upmixing algorithm called ProLogic 1 or ProLogic 2, ProLogic 2 being the most common. Um, and, and what that means is that the uh, Dolby box can decode an LTRT back up into 5.1 and replicate the, the 5.1 mix that happened on the mix stage as closely as possible. Um, it's not the same, but it's pretty, pretty darn close. That was our final question for that for this break. All right. So from there, we have plenty of different files moving into the online and final color sections. So we've got our sound files that we were just talking about. We've already went through the VFX pipeline. All of these were sending files through to the online. So I will hand the floor over to, we've got two people that are joining us to speak to this. More often than not these days, the online and, and color can have a lot of collaboration. So it makes sense that I introduce John as well as Andy together to take on this next section. Okay, yeah, so my name is John. Uh, I'm an online editor at uh, Sim Los Angeles and uh, Andy is a colorist here as well, we work a lot together, uh, work on the same system, we work on base light. Uh, so, so my job as an online editor is, is essentially to, to preserve and polish the offline edit at the highest quality and resolution possible while facilitating and, and, and integrating the work of the colorist, such as, such as Andy. Um, and what I mean by the highest quality and resolution possible is, you know, typically in offline, because of, you know, storage limitations and performance issues, that offline is usually working with compressed media, usually 8-bit uh, uh, HD, DNX, HD36, or something like that. Um, but we're often online and coloring with, um, you know, uncompressed, 16-bit files, you know, 4K, UHD, stuff like that. So, um, you know, basically I'm rebuilding essentially the offline cut at the higher resolution. Um, so, so basically we get we get the drive. We'll get we'll get the drive from um, yeah exactly the online master drive, and uh, we'll get the bin and. Uh, from offline, and our media department will, will will take the sequence, the lock cut of whatever show or movie we're doing, and they'll uh, they'll generate an AES and load that into um, some, one of their systems, and and basically pull selects because it's so much media. You know, on one of these online drives would be you know dozens of terabytes of media, so they only want to pull the selects from the cut, so they'll just pull those selects. Uh, do it some test conforms to make sure everything links up and then pass it over to me. And so then I'll conform, take the AAF, point it to the directory with the raw camera files and whatever, uh, you know, high res transcodes we get from dailies. Uh, and, you know, if all goes well, it'll all link up. And then I'll uh, make sure the timeline is, you know, it, it, Conformed in such a way that you know it's the, uh, the, an appropriate wide gamut for color, like S log or log C or something like that. And then, um, oftentimes when you conform in a system like a base site, well, I should mention that um, in the past, not too far distant past, it was much more common for the online system and the color system to be two separate systems. But nowadays, it's becoming more and more common to online and color in the same system. So there's a lot of base light, base light, 
projects happening, a lot of resolve, resolve projects happening, because um, there's a lot of advantage to staying in the same system and also doing cook based color with the raw media uh, that, you know, you can access all the metadata from those files and, and whatnot. Um, Which is definitely important to mention, considering that right now in this diagram, I've got it going from you in the base light to a resolve here, but really, Andy's actually coloring in a base light, right? Correct. Yep. Uh, yeah, he does. He does. Uh, he, we basically share a timeline, so we just pass the same timeline back and forth, and it, it has its advantages for sure. And um, and when you conform in a in an online system, uh, like like a base light or resolve or a flame or something like that. Uh, a, a, a lot of the effects do translate, which is great, but some of them don't. Don't. So um, for those clips where in Avid they're using plugins like Sapphire, Boris, um, we'll go back and we'll, we'll we'll you'll have to mix down those shots uh, individually and cut them back into the online. But but for the most part, things uh, either tra come come across or you can rebuild them. Uh, easily or, or it make them better in in some cases oftentimes things like split screens are kind of done loosely and offline and then I'll redo them you know so that you can't you don't notice they're there and and things um, so so yeah so uh, I'll set up the whole timeline and um, and uh, pass it off to Andy and then uh, we'll kind of have a back and forth I'll also integrate all the visual effects so I'll send out clips to our own VFX department. I'll cut in VFX shots from third party vendors. Uh, and you know, this can happen simultaneously with, with color, but all the while it's, there's a lot of back and forth between online and color to, to get a show finished. Um, so I'll pass it over to Andy. Yeah, hey, hi, uh, I'm Andy Lickstein. Um, I'm senior colorist here, one of uh, seven uh, colorists here at uh, Sim in Hollywood. And um, uh, for what it's worth, I was on a on a DaVinci Resolve prior to Resolve for many years, and then uh, about 12 years ago, made the switch over to Baselight, and um, uh, and we've grown since you know from there. Uh, and I've been on it ever since, and I love it. So uh, I want to thank Jesse for actually uh, making this particular uh, flowchart a little Baselight more more Baselight friendly um, for us. Um, uh, tr traditional online here and elsewhere has been flame conforming and resolves. It's a very, very popular system. And we do that too, and, and that's what you'll see more often than not. Uh, but, um, but for what we do here, and in this particular um, uh, example, we, can, we will speak to um, finishing in base light uh, from color to finishing, you know, all the way through uh, to deliverables for the most part, pretty close anyway. Um, some of the important things that you've that we've spoken about um, earlier on with with Ryan um, preserving the creative intent of the DP um, and um, trying to keep that color pipeline as Peyton said uh, intact and as honest as possible. Oh yeah, if, if I may interject for a second, that's one of the things I wanted to mention was the that the the CDLs and LUTs from onset through dailies, those track all the way to online and color. So we can actually build a high res, high resolution, you know, high res timeline with those same CDLs and what's applied. So essentially it's an uncompressed high res version of the offline as a jumping off point for the colors. If they choose to do that, you know, I'd say 50% of the time that all gets thrown out and the color starts from scratch on the log media. But if they choose to start off at that point with the, the offline color uh, CDLs and LUTs, then they, they can do that. You're not supposed yeah, to. Yeah, we're even using it as a reference. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it is true. I mean, we try to, you know, that's why it's very important in the right up front in your entire workflow process to have these post-production, these, these meetings up front to get all this stuff squared away and to make sure that your, your, your producers like Peyton uh, uh, along with Ryan uh, are uh, basically generating this stuff, this media, and this pipeline um, in a color correction suite as close as possible because you really you want to preserve that to, you know in in final color and we really really do our best to uh, to make sure that um, when John does does conform a CDL along with the LUT that applies to that particular scene uh, or film 
that that it is um, that it closely resembles what what the DP wanted. Um, you can, we do um, have the option in um, in our platform in Baselight to be able to throw away all that information, work from directly from log, creating our own curve. Of course, um, again. We love guys like Ryan who are really, really on top of things and are able to um, to bring a lot to the table because I will use that grade. If VP loves it, I'm all about it. That's perfectly fine with me. Um, uh, I want to be – my job is to facilitate the look of the show and to offer uh, as much as I can in the way of a creative input. But um, ultimately, it's, it's I don't own this. It's the client and the DP that owns it. So just wanted to, you know, get that straight out there. Um, some of the uh, some of the pitfalls in a session, and it all comes down to when you're in a session, much like when you're in uh, when an editor is editing, he is, is faced like I guess it was Tyler that was telling us about uh, when they're faced with so much media. Um, it didn't used to be like that. Um, and and now um, footage is again footage is not coverage, so he will sift through so much material to get to the one shot that a showrunner remembers and that I know I shot it I know it's there how do I get to it and then thankfully you have people in this pipeline like Peyton and like um, uh, like our post producers here that can really really dig deep and find that particular shot that they were thinking that, that the editor needs. And it does work its way down the chain and into our timeline. So back to our timeline. Um, in Baselight, um, John will will create this um, timeline that could be uh, layered with mats. Um, sometimes we get material that is that is composited, pre-composited, pre and we don't get mats, for example. Um, uh, but when we do, we love it, and we are able to grade on the A and B sides, C the sides of the mat and be able to create all sorts of wonderful image, imagery and, and, you know, fulfill the, the look of the show. Um, uh, what else can I tell you? It's, it, it's also important in uh, Final Color. In Final Color, you are the last set of eyes, really, that people are going to see. So uh, now with the large resolution, high resolution formats such as, you know, 4 to 8K um, and doing things in high dynamic range, which is what we're starting to do as well. Um, you really need to, see, need to see the 4K. If you look at a, uh, an HD proxy, you're probably doing yourself a disservice because there will be stuff that is hidden and you won't see it. So it's important to see um, see it on a correct in a view and viewing environment that will correctly display, display 4K. Um, also, um, some of the things that that um, that we encountered when creating high dynamic range content. Uh, uh, from uh, with a DP and going through uh, looks and and creating set, setting looks in high dynamic range is the occasion where how's it where we would ask how is it going to look to the masses how is that high dynamic range beautiful beautiful 600 to 1000 nit element going to look uh, when it's been um, analyzed via Dolby Vision to an SDR element and how will the DP um, be able to modify his, pra his practice to be able to to give that uh, you know the oomph, if you will, to the colors that exist in high dynamic range that don't exist in standard dynamic range. So, um, so those are the things that we come across in a, in a in our post production workflow. Um, in an, in a bay, the experience in a bay, you want to be able to to flag a, a great many of these things and say, okay, um, you know, maybe in the in the, in the you know, the, the pre-meeting or the look meeting that you would have with the DP. Um, hey, maybe we we need to, you need to drop this, you know, the, these hot keys down, a st uh, you know, a stop because we can always bring them up later. Um, you know, things like that. Just they, they, they're, There are definitely some, some ways to fix those minefields at the end, but um, it's always good to have that pre-pro pre meeting. Um, and uh, what else could I tell you? Uh, developing looks. It's um, happy to create LUTs with the client, uh, and happy to uh, work with the CDLs that come from Ryan and and Peyton. Uh, and but we don't always have that luxury, and um, uh, we have to deal with a 709 conversion, which is perfectly fine uh, to get to get the work out. But um, 
you know, that's that, that's that's what we're faced with, and all the things that we've discussed earlier on in this uh, in this in this webinar is is so crucial at the end uh, because again, we're the la last set of eyes before. Uh, John gets it, and then he's another set of eyes, and he says, "Oh, that water bottle that Ashley mentioned needs to be removed. What a drag, you know." Yeah. But we have to, you know, those are the kind of things that come up. And it's like, oh, an oops, gotcha. And in the post-production process, you don't want those surprises. So, um, Jesse, I don't know what else you would like to direct it, but that's I, th I think that was great. Yeah. So um, we do have one more section to go through, but before we get into that, um, I think we have time for for a question. If there are, if there is one, there actually is two from the same person. If you don't mind, okay, um, let's hear it. it's from Brian, and Brian says, uh, "Is there an advantage to VXF compositing, fixing, and such before color correct?" And he explains when he when he says color correct, he means color in general, not specifically correct. Um, but uh, is there any uh, advantage to doing that uh, as it happens in this workflow? Um, any disadvantages? And also, what do you mean by opticals that base light can't recreate? Thank you. Uh, so John, you you're welcome from... to take that one. I can Please. jump in. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Oh, no, no. I, I, I think you should start. Um, it's all you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, as far as the, the opticals question, basically, uh, it I kind of what I was mentioning with the plugins. There's cer certain things that aren't available in the online systems, um, or even if they are available. Like, like for example, Sapphire. You can you can get Sapphire for Baselight or Resolve, but none of the keyframes or parameters come across. So you essentially have to punch in all of the uh, parameters anyway. So it, it, it's it's a it's too cumbersome and time consuming. So yeah, for, think of for it things like, like that. Effect. It's like an effect that didn't get turned turned over to the VFX facility or any type of VFX vendor to work on. It's 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 little effects that were done in the offline edit that need to be recreated in the online, but they didn't feel it was necessary to send it to a VFX company to do. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Correct. And that and there's usually in the form of you know, third party plugins like Sapphire and, and Boris. You know, it's little things like, you know, that there's something that editors love called fluid morph, which is, you know, if an actor is in between lines and they, they stall too much and there's they're, they're too, too, too much time elapsed between two lines, they'll, they'll pull it up, they'll, they'll, they'll morph two parts of the same shot to kind of speed it up. Um, so that's, Something there's no need for that to go to visual effects, but there's also no no way to recreate it in base light or resolve. So you go back to Avid. Um, you, you know, currently we will use the DNX 444, you know, DNX HR444 codec to do that kind of stuff in UHD and 4K. Um, I know the new Avid has some has a new. Uh, it's like only an internal codec, but they Avid finally has uncompressed. You know. 10-bit, uncompressed 16-bit, and even 32-bit now internally uh, a resolution independent format. So, um, you know, we'll see when the other, when the, when the color correctors support those <laughs> files. They don't yet. Um, I actually rendered one out today and tried to look at it and resolve in base side and they, they don't even see it. So, but, but anyway, uh, th that hopefully that answers the optical question. Um, but, yeah, the other but part, though, it's, it's important for some clients. They don't want to walk into a color session and not see the final product. So some people, you know, they're, it, it's, it's start, the opticals and all these effects are certain, certainly starting to be supported more and more often in these online applications, like in the base light, in Resolve. They're starting to support more and more of these. But, you know, it used to be that we had to make a decision. Do you color on the negative or do you color while seeing your finished product. And, you know, when you go through a flame traditionally, so like that traditional workflow Andy was talking about, you'd render to DPX, then it would go to the color bay, but at least you had everything, you had your final show in the color bay. Whereas now you can, you can kind of do the best of both worlds. There might be some shots like we can see here that do need to go through that process, but there's certainly a lot of clients we work with that when they get to the color session, 
They want to see the final thing. They don't want to have to color and be told, well, it's, you know, we're going to add this and that. You're not really seeing what it's going to look like. But yeah, I think, I think Jesse, you're making the case for Max <laughs> right there as well. Um, you know, if we, if we have Max in, cut in addition to the, uh, you know, to the plates, um, and when John puts those together, he, he actually serves as our also, in addition, in addition to a compositor, he's also serving as a QC person to make sure it's right. So um, it's kind of a nice, uh, it's a nice combination to have that set of eyes. And then when it's composited, we have two log images, um, if you, you know, in the base light or resolve sequence. And then you, you can grade both sides. That, that to me is um, just such a game changer uh, in seeing final color and being able to adjust that as opposed to adjust the composited element. Composited element. All right. And Jesse, so, we do have one more question if you'd like to take it. All right, sure. Uh, this one comes from Timothy. Uh, Timothy asks, are conventional screens in home and commercial venues able to capitalize on the HDR technology as it relates to color? Now, my understanding is HDR is more luminance and uh, color volume is uh, more associated with color, but uh, I'll let you clarify that. I would say, this is Andy, I would say, yeah, by all means, <laughs> sure. I mean, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a new format. It's going to be, it's the future. It's uh, another wonderful tool and another exhibition format for, for people to uh, enjoy. I really think it, it is um, um, unlike, in my, in my opinion, unlike 3D, um, I think that this is something that, that is, is a real wonderful thing for people to have at home. And I don't think the future it's going anywhere John, either. I think mo it won't be long HDR until every film. screen has it. What's that? I, I said I don't think it's going anywhere, and I think that it won't be long until every screen at home is much higher than 100 nits. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Right. right. Definitely. So, but it certainly comes in range. I like it. I mean, you, you, when you grade your HDR shows, you're doing it at you know you're doing it on a bvmx 300 with at a thousand nits and and there's certainly varying monitors that people will have at home so it's not always a 100 percent match this i'm not even getting into obviously the settings on people's monitors if you have vivid color turned on and <laughs> whatever other setting for dynamic um no question yeah <laughs> yeah i mean here here at sim um, uh, several of our rooms are outfitted with X300s and the prosumer uh, complement in the larger format. So you know you can you can see the most accurate representation of that which is technically um, uh, technically technical spec up to technical spec. You know, so it's a nice match. So. That right. was our final question. Okay, well, next up, localization and distribution. So I'd like to introduce Bob Ack, if you'd like to take the mic. Hi, everyone. So we're going to talk about the localization and distribution services. So for everything that everyone talked about so far, so there were a, a lot of efforts has been done, and now the movie or the TV show is ready in the original language, like say English. So localization services are all the services that uh, that is going to take that movie from the original language and prep it for distribution and uh, prep it uh, for worldwide releases in say 40, 50 different languages. So the the movie that is so you have a movie or a TV show that is in English. Now you want to, you want to release it in Europe, in Russia, in uh, China, Japan, Middle East. Like again, 40 to 50 different languages. And the key part of it is uh, the, that all the localization services can be in different buckets, but the main ones are say subtitling is one of them. That is basically the text and translation that is on a screen for viewers to read. And then, uh, so that part, like a translator goes through the movie and they take it from the English. It's a person that is uh, native in the local language and understands English very well. So they go through the movie and they do all the translation, but more importantly, adaptation to that local culture. Like, because there are in the, 
in the original language, say English, there are many things like a slang, that jokes that are that make sense in English, but they might not make sense in Vietnamese, or in or what you have in Vietnamese is different than what you have in uh, in Hindi. So those translators need to adapt it to that culture. Like example, again, is like in the uh, U.S. movie, like a person might talk to his boss, and it might be a very informal conversation with a boss. But for Japan, for Japan, people have a very formal conversation with their boss. So it's, you gotta make sure you adapt it to that local culture that people in those countries can enjoy the can enjoy the movie or TV show as much as uh, people in the original language enjoying that. And that brings a lot of complexity. And uh, subtitling is mostly used uh, for type of the content that people can read or for the languages that the literacy is high and people can read. But then there is another uh, localization service, uh, which is dubbing, is one of the big ones. Like say if you have a child content, it's children content and animation. So the, the in that age, uh, children cannot read. So then you need to do it for releasing it worldwide. You need to do dubbing services on it. And that's, uh, that's a service that is actually for each actor in the movie. There is a voice actor for it in that language, in the target language. And it's a highly creative process that is gonna, that is going to go through the casting. Like say you have like a movie with Brad Pitt or George Clooney in it, so you need to cast in that target language, say Spanish, someone that can speak that uh, that language. The voice is similar to the actor in the original movie, and then it's going to go through the casting process and audition process that we pick like a voice actor for each main character or supporting characters in the movie. And then it goes through the whole directing uh, uh, with the director. The actor is going to be with the dubbing director uh, in the dubbing studio as they go through the process and then uh, through the recording process, the voice recording. Like actors need to say things in a target language with the same emotion, with the same uh, format to communicate all that when the, when the, Say there is a translating in Japanese or Chinese, so that's where the, there's a dubbing director to make sure all that uh, uh, all that creative intent is being communicated to the people in the in a foreign language. And some of them, like some of the actors for famous act, the voice actors for famous actors are as famous as as popular as the people in the U.S. in that country. Like the voice of uh say again george clooney or brad pitt or all the main actors or actresses here in any of the territories uh, they're really famous and they treat they, they expect their red carpet treatment and uh so it's a very is a process that's working very closely with the talent and uh, the complexity of the localization services is that you're working with 40 different cultures and uh, different uh, different time zones and different uh, uh, and different type of people like on a, on a typical new release movie like live action movie there might be 2,000 people uh, working at the same time worldwide on subtitling on dubbing and other uh, localization services. So in addition to those, there are, uh, a lot of the content being localized that we call access services that are audio description or closed captioning, which is basically for people with hard of hearing or for blind people, like audio description, that there is a voiceover for blind people that uh, that uh, explains what's happening in the scene, uh, that for the, all the people, uh, the like blind people or people with hard of hearing, they can enjoy, uh, they can enjoy like the content which is an area that is growing uh, really fast. I mean, there are more supports and regulations around the world to support that uh, for uh, more additional access services in, uh, in additional languages. And then text and metadata localization, which again, all localization services is to prepping the movie for the worldwide release. And that includes uh, a lot of the text translation that when when you see when you see a movie on iTunes store in uh, in India, then it's uh, all the all the description of the movie and the list of the actors. That's all in in that target language in Hindi, so or in any country. So all the text and metadata localization needs to happen, 
And another complexity is that there should be consistency across all the services. If you translate a joke, say, in your subtitle, it should be the same as how you translate it in, in, for your dubbing when you have the like, voiceover, and it should be, if there is any, anything in the uh, text and metadata, it should be the same, uh, same consistency. And then, so that those are all localization services, which is really key now, and it's getting uh, with the Netflixes of the world and Amazon and Apple of the world releasing content in more countries and more languages at the same time. So that uh, the localization business is changing really fast, and a lot of innovation is happening in it. And then, when all the materials are localized, then that gets us with distribution. Now, all the content and assets are ready in the original language, say English, and in other like 40 different languages, that's when the final packaging and distribution to consumer happens. That is uh, like for a typical uh, new release movie, it might be five to 600 global packages, uh, that two or 300 of them might be digital cinema, that those are the, uh, the packages that goes for theaters, the people uh, in different countries around the world. It could be 20 physical media packages like DVD and Blu-ray, again, for different regions, and then um, and also to digital retailers, of course, like iTunes, Netflix, and Amazon of the world, and uh, also digital hospitality. That are, those are the packages that goes for airlines, like cruise ships or hotels. And uh, so each of those five or 600 packages, they have different spec and different... Um, uh, the different requirements, and so those are all distribution services that all the content, when we have all the finished materials and finished content, they need to be the package for separate, I mean, differently for, the, again, theaters and physical media and digital media and distributed around the worldwide, uh, worldwide vendors to for the final uh, distribution to consumer. And uh, any... And with that, I think we can open it up to questions, Jesse. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I actually have one. With the, the sure. localization side of things, you talked about changing some of the, the action, essentially, or changing some of the audio within a scene if it didn't make sense for the colloquialisms of the location. But does that get to the point where you actually shoot or alter scenes rather than just cutting things out? Like, let's say... Um, there is a scene that's just not appropriate to be aired in a certain Asian country that, you know, is a North Ameri normal in America, but maybe not normal there. Or maybe someone looks at a piece of food and they think, ew, that's gross. Those are anchovies. We all think it's gross in North America, but maybe somewhere else they, they don't see it that way. Would you actually go back and sometimes actually reanimate or reshoot certain scenes? So the, it's a very question. Actually, yes, sometimes that happens, and it's getting more and more. And one example is exactly what you said, that there was like a animation, is a good example, like one of the animations, uh, that, uh, that the character is eating actually bell pepper. <laughs> I think it was bell pepper. I said, I hate bell, bell pepper. But like for Japan, like the kids over there, they love bell pepper, so they changed that to something else. Like Or actually, I think it was... Uh, uh, yeah, it was one vegetable, but they uh, recreated that segment, which I think it was like seven to ten second segment, they recreated that uh, to change the fruit, because mm. you're creating it for that culture. In some cultures, it doesn't make sense that you don't like that vegetable. Interesting. Wow. All right, any other questions? We do have a question, and anchovies are yummy. Um, Pei Lun asks, would the redubbed version get sent back to the original mixer for print mastering? Yeah, so there are, for mixing, there are, uh, there are two ways of doing it. So one is that we call centralized mixing, that, it, that all the dub version might come back to, to, like say to the US in this case, and then be reviewed by the uh, original mixer or, uh, or for consistency across languages as well or they might be done, uh, or the final approval might be in territory. So there are two workflows for it, depending on the studios and client and the project. Uh, and if I, if I could just jump in here, typically, <clears throat> I mean, sometimes that does happen. Typically it's done out of country um, at, at, at localization facilities. Very good, and that appears to be our final question of the evening.
All right. Well, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, definitely, for sharing all of their wisdom. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we will be taking a poll to find out which should our next webinar deep dive into. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And before we close, we will also thank Black Magic Design for their generous support. So safe travels, take care, and we'll see you next time.